Uh, my name is Sherry Flummerfelt, and I'm with the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust. We're a nonprofit uh, based out of Monterey. It's working with commercial fishing here. And we've been hearing a lot of questions regarding eligibility for the Seafood Trade Relief Program and whether the application forms are really cumbersome and difficult or not. And so we reached out to the folks at USDA who generously agreed to take the following hour to go through some of the answer some of your questions and walk through the application. So I am going to hand it over in just a minute, with just a couple of quick keeping rules around Zoom. You know, we have muted everything by default so that we won't be disrupted. Uh, so if you want to speak at the end when we go through Q&A, please just make sure you click the microphone icon at the bottom of um, at the bottom bar to mute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off. And when you're not speaking, please try to remember to unmute, or sorry, to mute yourself, to, to minimize some of the background noise. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat box if you are on Zoom, and we're gonna be collecting them and tracking them and coming back to them at the end. You can also raise your hand and we'll try and keep track of that if you have questions. If you're on the telephone at the end, uh, please feel free to, um, I guess, just speak and we will, and try and answer all the questions, but feel free to reach out. We'll put our contact information as well in the chat box. So if you do have questions that we don't get to, we can turn to find answers. And with that, I would like to uh, pass it over to the folks at USDA. Celia, <laughs> to, uh, join the meeting. Dav and Kelly, who will be walking us through the program, application forms, and some of the questions. I'll hand it over. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mary Duggar. I am a uh, the program specialist at the joined the meeting at the state FSA office. So I'm going to go over um, some of the beginning uh, eligibility um, eligible uh, commercial fishermen, and then eligible um, the eligible commodities or eligible species. And Charles then, Greenberg joined the meeting. And then Navdeep Dillon is going to go over the portion about completing the form. So I hope that everyone has had a chance to review the webinar um, that um, the link was sent out for. And so I just want to provide us a little overview. Um, so, you know, some of it will probably be a repeat. Um, so anyway, I'll go ahead and get started. And like she said, um, like Sherry said, there's there will be a chance to um, voice some questions and, and hopefully provide some answers at the end. But there's also a chat um, option where you can type in your questions. Okay. So, um, all right. So 2020 Seafood Trade Relief Program strip. strip. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go over the policies and provisions. Navdeep is going to do the forms completion. And, and then we do have our, um, we're, we're lucky enough to have our program manager from DC on with us so she can um, you know help us answer some of the questions okay so what does strip strip do it provides direct support to u.s commercial fishermen who hold a valid federal or state license or permit it's not a loan it's a payment and it will not be factored or sequestered okay so who's eligible um, commercial fishermen who are in the business at the time of application Fishermen with a federal or state license or permit to commercially catch and sell or transfer fish. And fishermen who have ownership interest in seafood production, which would be like a landing report of U.S. caught and sold, um, you know, fish in, uh, or seafood, I guess, in calendar year 2019. So basically, you had to be active in 2019 and have the sales. And then um, you also have to be active in 2020 um, at the time you're submitting your application. Unless your season is over, then that's understandable. But as long as there's activity in 2020, um, we consider that active. So a person or who's eligible, a person or legal entity's adjusted gross income cannot exceed 900,000. And we're using the average of 2016, 17, and 18, um, those tax years. And that's on a CCC 941 form that now will go over in a little bit. So if there's some of you that have AGI exceeding 900,000, 
Um, if you have at least 75% of your adjusted gross income um, is derived from farming, ranching, or forestry, and now they've added seafood production, um, then you could be eligible. You, you could be Join the meeting. You could be eligible then, and that's on a form CCC 942, which I'll talk about a little bit later. You also must be a U.S. citizen. So applications can be submitted to any FSA county office during the sign-up period, any nationwide. So sign-up started September 14th and the deadline is December 14th. And applicants um, are allowed to certify production, but encouraged to provide production records at the time of application. We will be performing spot checks. If we already have the records, you won't even know your spot check because we'll just um, you know, unless there's an issue, we'll just, you know, access your records that you've already turned in and we'll be good to go. Um, applica applicants are required to maintain, you need to maintain your production records. Brianna Hoyker, join the meeting. For up to three years after filing the appli your application, um, you need to provide supporting documentation, if it's not already on file, to substantiate the, your claimed um, production and that it's reasonable and um, you're required to um, also provide supporting documentation um, be just because we want to make sure that you were active, um, had ac commercial fisherman fishing activity in 2019 and 2020. So payments are based on, the, on your ownership share of the reported pounds of production from the whole calendar year 2019, um, ending on December 31st. These are the eligible commodities and their rates. And um, I don't think I'm going to read them. Okay, so, um, so what's not eligible? So seafood that is grown in a controlled environment are not eligible for the trade relief program except for gooey ducks and salmon. Seafood processors and processed products are not covered under STRIP program. And um, the payment limitation, so there's a $250,000 maximum payment for any person or legal entity. Okay, so. Um, Hold on for a second. I just want to clarify on that bit. This is Kelly Dawson, by the way, um, the program manager for the Seafood Tree Relief Program. Uh, going back to the payment limit, uh, that's correct. It's on an individual basis or legal entity. If that legal entity was actually uh, a general partnership, then it would be 250,000 per member of a general partnership or a joint venture. Just wanna make that clear. Yeah, I should have added that. Okay, thank you. All right, so the mm -hmm. actual- Join the meeting. Okay, so the actual application is a form 916. There's a AD2047, which is a customer data worksheet. Most of you are probably not already in our system. So this is um, us gathering information from you so that we can put you in as a, rec you know, a customer record in our system. There's an AD2016, um, and that's where you, I think it's uh, like a, it's gender, it's nationality, and that kind of information that is important for reporting purposes to meet our um, requirements for uh, civil rights and, all, and all, you know, make sure that we're addressing everyone, not discriminating. Okay, um, and then within, uh, within 60 days of signing the application, the um, applicant agrees to uh, complete and submit a 902, which Navdeep's gonna go over, and 901, and that's going to be information about if you're an entity about the members, so that we can load. We want to load the the entity and the members in uh, the 941, which is the adjusted gross income form that I just talked about a little bit ago, and the 942 if it's applicable, and that's if you exceed 900,000 and 75 percent of your income um, is from seafood operations. Okay, so um, applicants are to submit one application. So one application um, to any FSA office in the nation. You can do that in person. You can do it by mail. You can submit it electronically, which would be fax or emailed. And then there's a, a box plus one span option as well. 
Okay. So um, now I'm just going to go to the forms completion. And um, I need to figure out how to stop sharing, I think. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there you go. And I need to unmute myself too. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Navdeep Dillon. I'm the Fawn Program Chief for California. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, perfect. I think everyone can see it. So I know we had, we received a lot of questions um, just because all of um, you are new to FSA. There's a lot of forms um, that, that are needed in order for you to have a complete application. And so we wanted to kind of go over which parts of the forms need to be completed. And uh, I know there's been significant questions around the farm operating plan. Um, it's a link, there are lengthy forms, but for, for this program, we're only requiring certain sections of that form to be completed. So I'm just gonna go over that a little bit too. So this was a form that Mary mentioned, it's AD 2047. This form is basically, this is where we collect um, your information or the producer's information to put them in our system to complete the application and to issue a payment. So this is really important that all this information that's entered here on this form is correct because we do verify your name against, against the social security number with IRS. And if it does not come back as a valid match, that could possibly delay your application processing and your payment. So we wanna make sure that if you're filing as an individual, as, as a person, then you're filling in your name correctly and the social security number associated with that. And if you're filing as a partnership or as a, uh, as a LLC or a corporation, we wanna make sure that the name is, is spelled correctly and that we have it in the format that you've got it filed with IRS and then provide us the, um, the federal ID number that's associated with that entity. And, uh, and, which, and uh, which form number were you referring to? I'm sorry. Uh, right now I'm, look, I'm looking at the form AD 2047. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, and so we want, this is our starting point. So we wanna make sure that the information on this form is completed correctly so that that will trigger us into going into the application and then the 902 and 941 and all of that. So we wanna get this information correct. And on this form, uh, if you're a new customer to FSA, then you do need to complete this entire form. Um, so we would like as much of this information as possible so we can have a good database for you to complete your application. And if you're an entity, then you may need to complete this, this form for each member as well so we can have their information in our system correctly. Okay, so this can is a question. Yeah. Can I ask you questions about filling out this form? Because I'm sure. confused. Okay. Uh, number five, number five, huh? and number six. And I'm a tribal fisherman. Okay. So number six is you're you're just you're going to participate in FSA is is what this program is is currently this program program is being administered by FSA. So that's okay. box that you're going to check there. And then um, a multi-county producer is if your if your um, if your land is in multiple counties, then that this is what you would check. But since you're we are filing one application for all of your interests um, nationwide, then at this point, I think you can just check one because all of your application is going to be handled by one county office. Yeah, and that that particular item, you would only have you can select no that you're not yeah. a multi-county producer. Right, correct, yeah. Thank you. And then I'm a new producer at number seven? That's yeah. correct. Yes. Okay. okay, then you're going to um, write, write in the name of the person who's filling out this form and, and date it. Okay, so the next Wait, form. Now, do we, uh, Navdeep, are we requiring them to actually sign this form because this is them certifying that this this is their information yeah, that they're providing us? Yeah, on the, on, on, in item eight, it says you only need to sign it if the information is being provided in person. 
Okay. Um, and if it's not, if you're emailing it to her, if you're faxing it, then you don't need to sign it. Great. And we, we require mostly, we want it whenever we're changing something, it's more important to get a signature of the person who's changing it than the first time when you're filing it. Okay, so the next and the part B is this is for the FS for our offices to complete. So you don't need to complete that section. Um, the next form that we're going to look at is our AD 20, 2106. This form is basically a questionnaire to uh, for us to have a record of uh, individuals and their um, gender and, and ethnicity and all this information here. Um, we would like for you to complete this form so we can have our system updated correctly. And if any, um, if we do have uh, any program provisions that are specifically applicable to a, 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 a particular group, then we can possibly do that outreach um, in those forms. Okay, does not require a signature on this form. Right. This is Kelly Dawson again. It's very important if you happen to be uh, a member of a federally recognized Indian tribe or Alaska Native um, or Hawaiian Native, it's important that we have that there, particularly with uh, our federally recognized Indian tribes, those members are not necessarily required to file an uh, income tax re return with IRS. And when we go to verify your adjusted gross income, it will get a response back that one was not filed. And uh, if we don't have it, uh, an indication that you're a member of that tribe that could possibly um, reduce your payment or while you may be eligible for the program, it may wind up reducing your payment to zero or by your share of the catch. So please make sure you complete that form. Okay. All right. So next form is our actual application. On this form, um, you're basically you're going to complete the sections that are highlighted in yellow. So the name of the individual that's um, that's the actual applicant. So this is a person who's eligible for the applicant. So the person that has the license for fishing and is the is the person that is um, is applying for the program. So we'd like your address as well, and these should match what's been provided on the on the eighty twenty forty seven. We'd like a contact information, a contact person. Um, if it's, it's, this is really important in case the applicant is an entity, we want to know who can we contact in case we have any questions. And then we want a phone number so that that makes it easier for us to contact you. Uh, next part C is this is where you're actually going to certify your production from 2019. So this is your, um, the, you're gonna do it by species that are eligible and then the number of uh, your actual counts that were that you had, you had an ownership share in. So if you're, um, you know, if you're sharing with multiple producers or multiple um, fishing operations and you've got uh, different shares that you are going to apply, you can file one application for yourself and you're going to include all of that production in this, on this application. Um, the next section, this is for county committee adjustments. This is nothing that you need to worry about, but we need to do for sure need to complete items three through six. And then you're going to sort of be sure to read this section, part D of the certification, exactly what you're certifying to. And then we want you to sign the application and date it. And if you're signing for someone, then we want to know it under what capacity are you signing. And if you're signing under a power of attorney for someone, uh, it's power of attorney, the only time you can sign under a power of attorney for someone with FSA is if you have a FSA power of attorney on file. And so it's a separate form. It's an FSA 211 that you have to complete. And so otherwise, um, the signature will not be accepted on, under a POA. Um, however, if you're signing for an entity, uh, if let's say you have a partnership up here and one of the partners is signing this form, you would sign it as a partner, and then on the form that we're going to go over later, the CCC 902, that form can indicate the signature authority, and then that will allow you to sign with FSA and on, on, on all of all these documents. Um, and then part C of the application, this is where the county committee will issue their determination, nothing that the applicant needs to worry about, um, but this section will be completed by the county office. 
Okay, so the next form that we're going to look at is your ACH direct deposit form. So all FSA payments are issued via direct deposit unless you have a uh, exception on file with FSA, um, which would allow us to issue you a check. Um, and so this form should be completed. And if you do any other direct deposits, it's very similar to uh, our regular direct deposit form name of the applicant, um, the financial institution where you want the money sent, their routing number, your account number, whether it's a, um, a checking or a savings account. Do you do want to make sure you double check your entries uh, and make sure that the information is correct because that's where you're, if you're approved for an app for payment, that's where the money will be going. And uh, you do want to have a uh, local the institution complete this section of the form, okay? Um, wanted to point out now Dave, that uh, if it's not possible for you to have your official at your financial institution to con verify that information, please include a voided check or even a, a, a deposit slip form provided it has your routing number and the account number so that we can verify that information. Okay, good. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, it's very important. Okay, so the next form we're gonna look at is our uh, farm operating plan. This is the one form that we've received a lot of questions about. So this is CCC 902I. This is, uh, this form is completed by, by an individual. So if you're filing the application as an individual, you use your social security number, this is the form that you're going to complete. So it's all you're gonna do is to put your name, your social security number, um, then answer questions in part B, questions one through four A, and that's it. And then you're going to go all the way to the end of the form and you're going to sign it. Even though there's a lot of entries on this form that need to be completed, you're only completing the sections that are highlighted. And you sign it and you date it and you uh, send it into F with your application. Um, so again, you're only completing this very top portion of the application of the 902 if you're filing as an individual, like the 902i. How if you're filing the application as a um, as a partnership or an entity, then you're going to complete um, the sections here again: the name of the entity, the ID number, when was the entity formed, what type of an entity is. You're going to check one of these boxes here, and then you're going to give us the um, the in the information about who the members are, the last four digits of their social security number, their share. Um, we don't really care about the salary at, in, at this point. You know, uh, relationship you should probably notate that whether this member has the authority to sign the application. So this is where you're going to complete this sex, this part to give them signature authority. Um, Again, we want to make sure that if, on this form, you're only filling out the last four digits of the uh, member's social security number. However, to put this member into our system and put them in on this partnership, we do need their complete social security number. So therefore, you do need to complete a AD2047 for each member of the entity to give us all that information that we need to complete their, um, complete their have a complete record of them in our system. Um, and then you're going to um, answer the next question is a citizenship question for each for the members. And uh, if you if you say yes or no, you're going to answer that question. And then you're again you're going to go all the way down to the end of the form. And each member is going to sign this form. So if you have a partnership of four partners, then each partner is going to sign for themselves. However, if you're filing an application is for a LLC or an LP or a corporation, we only need one person to sign it as, as, the, as representing that, uh, that corporation or, or, or an LLC. Partnerships, all partners have to sign. Um, and for a corporation or other, other set of entities, only one member needs to sign who has the authority to sign those documents. Okay, and then um, 
this information, the CCC 902, I'm sorry, CCC 901 is only needed if the entity that's filing the application has embedded entities. So let's say you have a LLC that's filing the application and one of the members of the LLC is a corporation. So then we need to, you need to fill out this form to give us information about who is in that embedded entity. So uh, here you would list the entity that's applying for the payment, the members of that entity, and then if one of the members is a, uh, a corporation or another embedded entity, then you're going to list that entity's information here and then tell us who the members of that entity are. I, I don't know, I'm not aware of anyone where it's that complicated. However, if you do have uh, a really complicated entity, feel free to contact the local FSA office and we can help you fill out that information. Or you can uh, get in touch with Sherry and then she can uh, refer us to you, uh, review to us and we can, Mary and I can walk you through that process as well. Um, the next uh, form is our AGI form, which is the CCC 941. This form, if you're applying as an individual, you're going to complete this form for yourself. And then you're going to indicate that crop, the crop year is going to be 2020. And then you're going to tell us whether your AGI is less than 900,000 or more than 900,000. So if it's less than 900,000, then you're going to check box A and sign and send that information to the county office. Um, and for if you're a, um, if you, let's say if you check that you're over the 900,000, then you want, you may have to look at the form CCC 942 to see if you can, if you apply, apply for the exception. Um, on this form CCC 941, if the applicant is a, um, is a, partnership, then each partner needs to complete the 941. If the, if, the, if the entity that's applying for benefits is a corporation, then the corporation needs to complete the 941, as well as all of the members of that corporation. And again, everyone is going to uh, fill out a separate form, certify to their AGI, and sign and, and, and take the form. This form, actually, we do send this form to IRS for verification of your adjusted gross income that you've certified to. And if it comes back as, as something other than what you've certified to, then, uh, then the, we will contact you for additional documents and, or, or provide you whatever options you have at that point. So it's very important that this form, you thoroughly review the form, what you're certifying to is correct because we do verify this document, this information with IRS. Um, again, okay, so um, um, 942, so this form is only required if you, if you certify on the 941 that your adjusted gross income is over 900,000, then you can file this form, ask for an exception to that rule saying that my AGI is over 900,000. However, more than 75% of my income comes from farming, ranching, or forestry, or sea, seafood production. Um, and then you, you certify to that. In addition to your signature, you also have to get either a certification here from a CPA um, saying that they, they agree with you, or you can submit a letter from a CPA. And it has to be a, a CPA who is licensed because we do require that they provide us a num license number. Um, again, this form is only needed if, you, if, you, if you're over the nine, 900,000 ATI limit. And I believe that is it for the forms at this point. And uh, so I think we will go ahead and open it up for questions. And uh, Sherry, if you want to start the questions, and then um, we'll let Kelly handle all of the eligibility questions, and, and then I will fill in where we can on, on forms completion and such. Sure. And it looks like some of the questions are already being answered, but I can uh, read them out. OK, perfect. Uh, David asked, uh, so is this for boat workers, too, or mainly for the owner of the company? I answered that it's for anyone holding a commercial fishing license and is landing fish. Um, 
David said, I'm a commercial fisherman, but get paid on percentage from boat for experimental fishing, slime eel fishing. Um, and the answer was slime eel isn't a species eligible for STRP. Um, Sherry, I want to, this is Kelly, I want to go back to the very first question. And that was, uh, the person was stating that they have a commercial fishing license. Uh, if that person is a crew member and they do not have uh, a permit to land fish or they do not have a share interest in the quota, um, <clears throat> the catch, they are not eligible for the program. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, I, I know that there are many fishermen that might be using someone else's boat or permit, mm -hmm. but they're the ones with, they're using their fishing license um, to sell the fish, but they don't own the boat or permit. Are they eligible? It depends on the arrangement that they have. If they have, a, a say, a lease agreement that they're involved with, then that's, they would both apply based upon their agreed upon share. Uh, there certainly could be cases where uh, there's a vessel operator that is uh, completing somebody's quota just for them and they're getting paid a set price of some sort. Does that help? I can, I can also tell you for uh, situations dealing with quota shares, uh, we're still working on that. We hope to have this policy finalized. Uh, we're we're making uh, making sure that we're re reaching out to various folks in the industry to number one make sure we're talking the same uh, language because what may be deemed as a lease could mean something completely different in your world. So we want to make sure that's correct. Uh, honestly, to answer that particular question you posed, Sherry, uh, I would say hold off until we get that policy finalized. Okay. Yeah, because that, that, that question seems to be, or a variation of that, seems to be the biggest issue that we're coming across is just uncertainty around eligibility. Right. Um, yeah. And we apologize for that. Just understand the, this program rolled out so fast and uh, certainly this is uh, new territory for us. What I can tell you isn't unusual for us is we're very familiar with share lease agreements. We're very familiar with working with cooperatives. So none of that is uh, uh, new information to us. It just happens to be the terminology and understanding how not only is it managed by quotas, but also your regions are managed. It, it's, it's certainly interesting, very complex, but we, I can assure you this, we wanna make sure that whoever is eligible, that they have the opportunity to apply and that we will do our level best to make sure that they get paid what they're entitled. Okay. Um, and so just, just go online and get one. Oh, sorry. Oh, maybe someone was not muted. Just to be clear, if, if someone is still uncertain about their eligibility, what is the best way then to find out? You said you're, um, yeah, could you just restate that? So um, to answer that, for, first of all, if they question whether they're eligible or not, I recommend that they reach out to their local office. They can also contact our call center. That, um, that telephone number is on the farmers.gov forward slash seafood website. And let me double check, excuse me while I lower my laptop here, folks. Oh, I had a nice sticky sheet and I had the phone number there. Uh, I wanted to be able to give that to you. Um, Mary or Navdeep, if you can look that up, please make sure we share that before we're done. Uh, what I can tell you is that if they believe they're, they are entitled to a share of this or a, they, they believe they're eligible, I still recommend that they submit an application because the worst thing would be is to not submit an application by December 14, uh, only to learn that, oh, wait a minute, I did meet that particular provision. I can assure you we'll have this stuff uh, nailed down certainly before the end of this month. 
but I don't, I don't want anybody to have, uh, you know, December 14 come and go and then say, oh, darn, I, I wish I had applied. It's better to submit an application. And if we need to go back and uh, get the data uh, tweaked and fine tuned, it's easier to do that than it is to say, oh, this is a late filed application and, and go through the administrative uh, loops there because I can tell you on late filed applications, we rarely approve those. It would take extenuating circumstances to do that. That's good advice. Um, I'm going to scroll. There are a lot of questions that have been answered in the chat box and I could keep reading through those, but there's a few that still have been unanswered. I'm going to actually jump sure. to those. Um, Claire asked, once all documents are emailed, how will I receive confirmation you've received everything? I've sent multi multiple applications and have only received a few verifications. Okay, um, a little confused on submitting multiple applications. The one thing we would encourage folks not to do is don't submit more than one application. Um, if you're submitting applications on behalf of others, that I would understand. As far as verification, um, I, I would expect that once the application is received, my, the way I would expect a field office to operate is to either provide a confirmation by a phone call or preferably an email if an email address was provided. Please understand that our staffing in uh, certain areas are extremely limited and we also are dealing with simultaneous uh, implementation of other program areas that's putting a considerable strain uh, on us. One of the things that they can do is once again, go back to the call center. This is our, our virtual field office staff and they can themselves inquire about what the stat they can look into the system and see what the status of the application is yeah so I think for if for california um we're just really slammed at this point in terms of uh, this program in addition to our um regular coronavirus program and, and everything else that's going on with the wildfires and and all so i think the best course of action is if you have a question regarding whether the application was received i think the best course of action is to for you to contact um that office via email and see if you can get a confirmation from them um and uh, if you if you still run into issues you can um, definitely contact sherry and then she can you know give us a call and we'll track something down for you but best course of action is to contact the local fsa office um, that you sent the application to. Um, and I did I'm, add the 1-800 number in case somebody needs it to the thank chat. Thank you, thank you. I want to point out that uh, in one of our particular offices, uh, there's approximately over 2,500 applications that still are not loaded in the system. That could be uh, a multiple. The good news is they got the application. The bad news is, is not being able to get them in timely. What I have been assured though, is that they do keep a log of all the applications that come in. So should somebody call that, um, and I'm talking specifically the Palmer Alaska office, they would be able to inquire either via um, email or by phone. And I would hope that they've got some sort of answering system, but if they didn't there, once again, the call center, they can look that up and find out. Uh, that's how I've been able to assist other folks is just making sure I get a name and where they sent it to. And I can tell you, we are, we are working to address that very issue of who's getting back to me to verify, Hey, I got, you got my application. Okay. Um, and I'll just read out the number for those who are, maybe can't see the chat box. It, uh, the call center number is 877-508-8364. 877-508-8364. Thank you, Sheriff. Okay, and so Lisa is asking, is the 941 filled out as exceeds and then the producer files 942 to supplement or is the 942 the only form required? That's a good question. So the 941, everybody 
that has a share interest must complete that form. If they do have an income that exceeds 900,000, they would certify to that and then they supplement it with the CCC 942 that must also be completed or verified by a certified CPA and or uh, attorney. So um, if their income is less than 900,000, the CCC 942 form does not need to be completed. Okay. Um, Luke is asking, will each member of an LLC who makes over 900,000 be required to fill out the 942? If their individual incomes aren't 75% derived from seafood or farming operations, does that disqualify the LLC applying, even though the LLC itself makes over 75% of their income from seafood production? That's a great question. Uh, the good news is, is that no, the LLC would not necessarily be, they wouldn't be ineligible, but it very well could be that that ineligible member, if they can't certify to 75% of their income being attributed to seafood harvesting, farming, ranching, or forestry, or other related industries uh, to, the, to those areas, then that payment would be reduced by that member's share. Yeah, so the only thing I, I would add here is that, um, so the LLCs would certify to its, uh, we're looking at reverse LLC certifying its income, they're looking at the form, I believe it's 1065 is a tax form that the LLC files. When each member is certifying to their um, uh, income, they're looking at their uh, 1040 form that they file with IRS. So LLC and it certifies to its AGI based on its tax return, and then each member there files their um, forms based on their individual returns or their joint returns if they're married. Okay. Um, Stephanie is asking, does Pollock include both Alaskan and Atlantic? Which specific species does flounder encompass? Okay, as far as uh, Pollock is concerned, uh, I don't have a specific species on that. And flounder, I do know that they had um, American place that they were considering and then it had flatfish in general. So my response to that has been all flounder because it, if somebody's gonna use flatfish, I'm thinking that's the whole gamut. I, what, what else do you do? Um, so my recommendation is if they have flounder, put down all flounder that was land ended commercially. I will, I'm going to do a quick check on the Pollock for you, okay? So I could keep reading through some of the, the questions and answers, but I actually just wanted to put it out there uh, to see if there's anyone on the who's called in by telephone or anyone who has questions that are not typed in the chat box. Hi, I'm looking to see if this is being recorded so I can look at this at a different date. Yes, it is being recorded. And um, this is for the Alaska salmon fishery also? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so I have to get the form, the 941 from the call number, right? You can do that. If you have access to the internet, you can um, go to our farmers forward slash seafood website and it has a link for all the applicable forms it even has a, a whole package if you wanted to just print off the whole package off at once and it includes instructions with that package if that, you want uh, just a, yeah. if you wanted just an individual form you can just click the hyperlink and pull that individual form that you would need the website was farmers i'm sorry oh sorry if i said that too fast it's farmers.gov that's gov forward slash seafood seafood uh -huh. and when you when it takes you to that page right at the very top it has the applications uh, package there apps. Okay, and I'm just, I can record, uh, this will be recorded, and can I get that on the farmers.gov slash seafood also, or do I have to go someplace else? Um, Sherry, you can answer that question. I don't know. I know we won't have this particular so one on the, There is a webinar that's on, on that, see, there is a webinar that's 
posted there, but it's not, it won't, it's not this one. That one's probably more detailed in, in terms of uh, the program, and this one has completing the forms. So I believe Sherry is going to post this on uh, their website. Yeah, well, I can, I'll put the link here, um, but it's um, Monterey, well, it's, it's a long link. I'll, I will add it here, and we'll also share it um, through some Facebook groups, but if people could just share it with each other, that would be great. But here, here's the link where I will add it. I'm also going to include a link. Oh, that's the link the... right there. I see it. Okay. okay. And Monterey Bay to... shellfish and org. There we go. Yeah. Seafood trivia. Seafood trivia. I got that. Okay. So I can go ahead. That's already on my phone. So I can go ahead and go to that one, right? Yeah. And it might take it might take a, you know a few hours or or a day to get it up there, but we'll um we'll post it there by, by tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there Hello. Any other? I'm on a phone, so yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, my name is Linda, and like I said earlier, I'm a tribal entity um, or an individual tribal member. And um, tribal members uh, are exempt from IRS um, in filing uh, for income derived from treaty fishing rights. So we don't file income tax on that. Right. Income. That, uh, and we're aware of that. However, you are still required to complete the CCC 941 form. And uh -huh. even though we'll get um, a response back from IRS with the verification whether a return was filed or not, our provisions are for payment purposes that you would still be eligible and we just keep it filed for our records. That's why it's important to make sure that form number AD 2106, where we're capturing civil rights data, that you please complete that form and indicate that you are a member of uh, um, an Indian tribe or Alaska native because our staff is not authorized uh, to record that information without your express permission recorded on that form. We're not allowed to indicate that it's employee observed or that, wow, uh, they sounded like that or they looked like that. We, we just can't do that. Okay. But yeah, that was a good, good point. What you'll do is, as I said, complete the 941 form. Also make sure that for your tribal members that would be applying for the program, make sure they complete form AD dash two one zero six okay and i can get that on the website yes ma'am so that's on our farmers.gov forward slash seafood website um so i wanted should, to go ahead should we include a copy of our tribal uh enrollment card that's not required okay if you want to do just that our, that's fine mm -hmm. just a copy of our fishing id uh if you have that that's great Okay, great. And then on the bank um, account information, can we just put a voided check on that page? Or yes, you, do we yes you can. Yes, you can. You still should complete uh, the name of the account. That's really important because um, we, we need to make sure that when we're recording, if you submitted your application as ABC Incorporated, but you have it going to a bank account in one of the um, officer's names, such as Jane Smith, um, we won't know that unless you record it specifically like that. If we, we can't complete that financial information without that, at least that portion being completed. And that's why if you do have a voided check, it will have that information there for us and it's very helpful uh, as far as confirming that information. And I have another tribal member here that wants to know what if they don't have a bank account? If you don't have a bank account, then your payment will be sent to you by a U.S. Treasury check in the mail. We certainly encourage okay. folks to try and uh, get a, a bank account um, it, it makes it a much more safe and secure way of receiving your payment, and it also is much timelier. You, once a payment has been approved and it's been certified and signed, it can take two to three business days before it appears in your bank account, whereas a treasury check, 
at least within the continental United States, can take up to 10 days before you receive it. Okay. Great. Um, and we have a copy of our catch sum summary that was provided to us by our fisheries department. So just include that with the application. That's perfect. As um, Mary mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation that if you provide that production information, that that helps us out because we will be doing spot checks. And if they already have it, then they're not necessarily going to have to ask you for any additional information if it substantiates what you certified to on the application form. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your help. You don't have a bank account. Okay, I have a couple of more questions here. I have uh, Lisa's asking if an FSA office is not the headquarter county, can those offices load the application or do we have to submit it to HQ County? You do not have to submit it to a headquarter county office. As Mary mentioned, you can submit an application in any county office. You don't even have to reside in that county. Uh, we certainly encourage folks to, if, if they have the opportunity to submit stuff electronically, please do so. It, it's, it's timelier um, and it also serves as a record that it was received by the agency. Once again, it, it doesn't matter which office it gets submitted to. It, we, we have, uh, you, you're perfectly fine to do that. Yeah, I'm, my goodness, if you were fortunate enough to go on vacation and say, well, I forgot to do this, let, let me take care of this. You could do it at that local office provided they have one there, so. It's a good question. Okay. Uh, James is asking, uh, least crab quota share, when do you expect to have rules on how quota shareholders and harvest boats apply? We, we will definitely have that nailed down before the end of this month. Okay. Okay. Oh, I want to go back, back to uh, a previous question by someone who was asking whether this presentation would be available later on, and I'm glad, Sherry, that you'll have that. For um, the state of Alaska, I included a link to their state homepage. And if you can't remember it, just look up Alaska State FSA Office. And when you go to their homepage, they, they have nothing but seafood trade relief program on there. And if you scroll down, they have a presentation on completing each form that was also reviewed in this um, and I'm just sharing that if you wanted to look at it right away. Yeah, that's great. And we can also add that to the same link so they're in the same spot as where we post this one. Yeah, they also include um, uh, for fishermen that uh, there's that would happen to be in the Alaska region. I would assume since this is California, you should be able to work with your California uh, local office. Or, or those who are within this region work with your local office, but um, we also have a call center address at that site as well. We got any other questions? I have to. I have six more minutes, and then I got to jump on another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I I, I want to share with you all that um, it, this I've worked here 33 years as first time I, we've had to work with a program of this size with the seafood industry, but I am thrilled. It's uh, uh, other than my children and my family, I love fishing and I'm talking deep sea fishing. It is uh, a passion of ours in our family. So this is kind of like a full circle thing for a farm girl. <laughs> hey, if, if, if no one else has a question, I have one. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Leonard Herzog up in Alaska. If, if, uh, if uh, someone has multiple boats like I do, and but the entities, I'm eventually going to be capped. You know, I mean, this would be a great sum of money to to get. But is should should the multiple applications be made, or should just one application be made enough to so that the entity, um, so that the individual entity that's part of the larger group. It's going to cap the other groups. Should I just submit one application or should I submit applications for all the companies that harvested seafood? Okay, this, and I think that question will be um, answered best uh, by the end of this month. I certainly would say that if you are an entity that has a share interest in the catch 
that you're want to you're going to want to submit uh, a separate application. If it's one where it's an entity that has that is embedded with other entities, say if you're a corporation that then has two LLCs associated with it, and then one individual member and another corporation, it, it's that whole LLC that's doing it, not not those individual bodies. So it really, right. gets yeah, for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. For yeah, me, like I'm a 100% member of the LLC, so, but I'll wait for more information. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, Gilia asked, can you please clarify that we should wait on not, wait on not, sorry, wait or not on I the application? I understand what they're asking. Should they wait until we finalize policy to apply or not? The preference would be yes, wait. But no matter what, um, if you're if you for some reason still haven't received clarification, or you haven't been able to find it, then I would say still go ahead and apply. Just make sure you do it by December 14. I can assure the group on this call we will have this policy finalized before the end of the month. But Kelly, again, can you just summarize what the pending policy is at this point? I mean, sure. there's certain certain application that can be filed because it's straightforward, but I think. So the yeah. straightforward ones are the ones where it's 100% share interest. You don't have anybody else involved with it. Uh, the ones that we're specifically looking at right now are the uh, Alaska fishery regions or areas where it's associated with quotas. And then you have your um, IFQs, uh, as well as dealing with members of community development associations that that's where a percentage of the quota is um, distributed among the six different uh, CDQs. We're trying to get that hammered out so that we can make sure we're letting everybody know exactly who's eligible to apply and for what, for meaning what share of it, because it, it seems like um, it's not seems like I know that there is a wide variety of differences there. Uh, when I'm talking specifically about the quotas, we're looking at quota holders, we're looking at lease, uh, quotas that have been leased, and we're also looking at transferred quotas, be it, you know, a medical emergency or what have you, it was transferred. Making sure that we're addressing each one of those scenarios so that the folks understand who's supposed to apply. Um, then once again, in dealing with the CDQs, uh, we want to make sure that um, is it going to be the community development that applies or is it going to be the individual fishermen that um, commercially landed that. I want to make sure that we have the correct information out to y'all and if it happens to be somebody's already applied, we will work that out. Is there, um, so, so we have the website, we have the telephone, is that, you know, we, the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust, while well, I'm happy to, to collect questions and send them on to you, but we are telephone focused, so I know there might be a better number for the folks in the last one to go um, Farmers.gov forward slash seafood. Okay, that's it. So just go to farmers.gov forward slash seafood, and the number is there as well. Um, or feel free to forward questions to me, uh, and I can help help find you an answer uh, at sherry at mbfishtrust.org. Uh, but I, I just want to thank you. It's now almost two o'clock, so thanks so much. Um, You're very welcome, and I'm sorry I have to leave. I got to jump on another call. It was great. Thank you for putting this together, and thank you, Navdeep and Mary. Um, I really appreciate what you all do. So um, I, I certainly, if you feel it's necessary to have another one, uh, please uh, make arrangements and I'll, I'll try to make sure my schedule is available to y'all. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Um, Navdeep, anything, any last things you want to say? No, I, I, I think that was, uh, so we did a lot of questions around, around the, the whole eligibility. So uh, just a few pending um, answers on that. But I think if you have specific situations, um, you know, we wouldn't mind discussing those as much detail as, as can be shared. That would help. 
Um, and so I think it's hard to answer general questions, but if there are specific issues uh, that we can address, uh, if you feel com if the uh, folks on the fall call feel comfortable sharing that any details with the county office, they, you can definitely share it with them or, or send it up the line with us and, and we will definitely get some responses out. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Question, but I think um, we've got to let folks go. So thanks so much, everybody. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye.